Welcome to Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things, the podcast show. I'm your host, Kerry Roberts. And today I have another extraordinary guest on, Mr. Achilles Larrera. Welcome. I'm so excited to have you here today. Kerry, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. So you have been in the financial wellness space for quite a long time, helping a lot of executives and entrepreneurs. But I want to start with your story first. And, you know, you kind of talk about how you grew up kind of watching your mom kind of struggle with money and then having to really pay for yourself to go through school. Can you talk about what it was like for you when you were younger, kind of watching your family and how that kind of put uh, just some ideas in your head about finances and wellness? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the simple part of it is we were an immigrant family. Uh, I'm first born here, a uh, first generation American. And my parents, God love them, uh, worked as hard as they did, but did not really have any financial uh, education or background uh, in the traditional sense. So, they, you know, that made things difficult. I can remember my father working two, three jobs. Uh, you know, I had two older brothers, so there were three kids to support. And, you know, that made for difficulties as uh, we all grew up and uh, certain embarrassing scenarios that I won't get into here. But things did change over time. And I'd like to say that things got better, uh, you know, with their, uh, not with the education but with the fact that they started earning more money, uh, learning the language, depending on us for language as well. Uh, and, but they finally got to the point where English ended up being the predominant uh, language in the house. Once I was an adult, it wasn't really until then. Um, but e even so that uh, Spanish was really spoken, it was the first language that I learned. Uh, and you know, I, I'm, I can't say I'm speaking it a uh, hundred percent of the time I'm speaking it maybe 40 to 50 percent of the time and uh, it's more for my kids and their benefit these days so um, I you know it, it's just amazing that with my mom uh, I felt that if she had that background and she had that education that I felt that the story would have been a lot better I did not get into the business until a later time uh, to help her out, but she, you know, she was the catalyst behind everything. That she had worked for a company in the garment dis, uh, district for about twenty to twenty-five years, almost twenty-five years, and all of a sudden, all those jobs went away. They went to China. They went to the Far East or India, and uh, my mom pivoted. I remember her, you know, being one position, and she pivoted to being a bookkeeper, and that lasted a little longer but she knew the writing on the wall and she had a 401k and a profit sharing plan with this particular job but she didn't know anything what to do at that particular point and it wasn't just her there were plenty of her co-workers who were in the same boat by the time i got into the business uh it was a couple of years after and most of them had been left go let go but they were still in that boat where the money was still with the company and it was they were getting no guidance no advice whatsoever and definitely no one who spoke their language uh to help them along. i mean they spoke english to a point but it's kind of like um I'll just to give you a for instance i mean i call my spanish third or fourth grade <laughs> when it comes to reading and writing and that's actually very good here considering i'm self-taught you know? <laughs> So uh, can you imagine someone with English, you know, that might be first or second grade and they do very well here. They're hungry. They work hard. But not having that base, in my opinion, is a disadvantage. And that's where advisors like myself come into the fray and we can make a huge difference in our clients' lives if they're simply willing to let us engage them and really take them to the next level, not only with the understanding of finances and money, but 
how can they adjust their lifestyle going into retirement and the like but i don't want to bore you with every with that onslaught just yet you know we gotta we gotta go step by step on this. yeah so. i want to go back to your story because i think uh you know it's interesting i don't know if you notice if there's a difference in generations or different backgrounds or where different people live but i feel like most people don't really learn about money it's not taught really in school um, we really only see what our parents do or maybe the little that they teach us. And it's something we tend to learn later on. Would you say that that's pretty common across the board or do you see a difference in men versus women or generations or different backgrounds? No, it's not even that. It is, I'll give you for instance, for a Latino family here, unless uh, one of the family members was involved in finances, no one's going to have that background. Hmm. However, if you talk, you know, I, I watched my Irish friends. I grew up in an Irish neighborhood, an Irish German neighborhood, and I watched how they were taught from an early age about real estate, about some financial education. And the same thing uh, whenever we talk uh, to our Jewish friends, uh, it would be the same exact thing. They received a solid financial education, but not in school. It was always done in the home. And this, uh, it would be, you're going to make this financial decision because, and given a good answer, not because I said so, because they were given solid foundation principles to follow from the get-go when they were, I, I want to venture to say, I remember listening to this when I was seven, eight years old, you know, grandma's buying you some stock. <laughs> and Oh, isn't this a pretty <laughs> certificate? And the kid didn't know what, the, you know, what grandma was talking about, but they did know that it was a pretty certificate and that they would get money every four months, every quarter. So that was a nice thing to start your education. And that's actually, Carrie, that's one of the first things the, when I first appeared on TV, that was one of the first subjects we talked about when I was on Fox News. Yeah, I well, that's interesting. Like you said, that different kind of uh, backgrounds are able to do that early on. And it's just a part of their culture and part of what they talk about. And as you said, people like yourself now and trying to have that conversation earlier. Now you put yourself through school how did you do that? Because if you realize at a young age, okay, you know, this is probably maybe not going to happen. I'm watching my parents and, you know, we're, we're kind of doing the best we can. If I want to go to school, I'm going to have to do something. What did you do to be able to make enough money to do that? There was, uh, well, school, it's relative. And school was much less uh money than it is now now it's someone's yes, salary every single year at the time i was in school it was four thousand plus a semester now i had a lot of help you know i had some help monetarily for people who believed in me uh, from people who believed in me i also was taught something by one of the people at the university level and they told me you do not have to accept the entire amount. And I said, what does that mean? That means you go in there, if they tell you it's 4,000, you can negotiate that down to a lesser amount. You're just gonna have to do it every semester. And Wait, I is that in, still true now or no? That was just back then. As far as I know, and there are a few gentlemen who are still doing this, that you do not, you know, it's like retail versus wholesale pricing. You do not have to take the amount of money that they tell you it is, you can go and find someone in authority, explain your circumstances to, which is exactly what I did. You know, I was working two jobs to get, help get me through school. Uh, you know, one of them was at UPS and one was in a karate school, you know, and I can remember at one point, every semester going into the bursar's office, sitting down. I can imagine them could be coming at them and say, oh God, it's Achilles again. You know, <laughs> you know, how much money are we gonna have to give them this time? You know, what are we giving up this time? I have to see this guy every single you know semester and true to form, 
it was the same speech every time I gave them. It wasn't it wasn't false. It was absolutely true. I had to fight for myself because, you know, I have an old saying uh, when I started TV. I go, you know, my mom loves me on TV, but I need more people to watch me than my mom. <laughs> <laughs> So going back to the, you know, the bursar's office, having someone there who understood me and said, okay, we can do this and working my way in school and coming out of university debt free was super important to me. It meant giving up hanging out with my friends as much as I wanted to, because, yeah. you know, their parents were paying for it my parents didn't have that ability. So, you know, in freshman year, imagine you're, you, you know, you're faced with that huge bill. You, you have some people helping you out, you know, and but you're paying those people off throughout the semester. And you, you actually learn about building credit at that time, even though you weren't. But with those people, you were, because you were paying them back solidly. You know, a few people would lend me money, and on my case in point, my oldest brother was in a position he could lend me a little money. and But he was paid back before the semester was over. And I kept my promise to him that that would happen. And every single semester, he would lend me the money to go through. And for that, I'm forever grateful to him and everyone else who uh, helped me out. So that was just, could you imagine, Carrie, not having that knowledge, you know, or someone in the bursar's office pulling you on the side and say, hey, Achilles, I want to have a chat with you. Come here. You know, now don't tell them I told you this because I'm <laughs> going to get in trouble, you know, but I've heard other students do this. And, you know, I kind of wish that I had a person like that giving me career advice because <laughs> I would have opened my shop a lot sooner. Now, I'm thankful that I've had my business 20 uh, almost 20 years now uh, and that I've been doing what I'm doing over 25 years. So I, I'm very grateful to this business. It has been uh, a love affair, uh, you know, other uh, than uh, my family, you know, it's been a love affair and I've been able to do something that I love and I'm very fortunate to do so. Well, yeah, when we can do something we love and help others and you've had the experience yourself to see it firsthand and then grow your own financial education and wellness. I mean, that's that all comes together perfectly. That's what we're looking for. So we're talking today also, this other side now, about, you know, how do we create financial wealth? You know, let's start with maybe someone in the beginning, uh, maybe, you know, coming out of college. And then I'd also love for you to talk about, because I had someone, you know, ask me, you know, in their 50s and 60s, well, yeah. what do I do now? Is it too late? So can you kind of give us maybe a couple suggestions or tips for kind of either of those age ranges or in general for people that are like, okay, I haven't really started. I'm not sure what to do to improve or increase my financial wellness and wealth. Well, I, I'm going to reference an older movie uh, with uh, Rodney Dangerfield, uh, you know, where his son is in university and he decides to go back to school. And he, at, at the end, he's giving the commencement speech to the class and he's like, kids, this is the best advice that I can give you. Stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> but the absence of that, and a bit of it rings true, Carrie. You know, if you think about it, you know, you stay at home, you're not paying a rent every single month, but there's a trade-off, you know, that you're living at home, you know, but that allows you to build the nest egg that you need, that when you get your first job, most first jobs are not enough to pay the rent. And you have mm -hmm. to room with people that you haven't met before in some cases. And, you know, you're going to have a few bad experiences. It's just part of the game sometimes. You know, it's like university. You don't always have a good roommate. Thank God I, I commuted to school and I didn't have to deal with that. But so if I'm starting out, I'm just out of college and, you know, ready to go and things are cool, you know, and all of a sudden I say to myself, have I saved up like six months worth of uh, savings, you know, of my monthly expenses? And what you really have to do is sit down with yourself and say to yourself, what do I spend on a monthly basis? And let's not talk about the bar bill. <laughs> <laughs> let's not talk about your clothing, your shopping. All right. Uh, let's talk about what are the real estate, you know, rent, 
food, uh, you know, all the necessities in life. Right now, you know, internet, internet is a necessity, you know, and most people are using the internet. They're not buying it through, uh, you know, Time Warner. They're going and using their phone for the most part. They're not really, you know, doing it in any other way. As a matter of fact, most consumers are buying their things through their phones, especially in the ethnic communities now. Uh, the Latino community, it, it's, it, the figure is over 70%. But I know for a fact, Asian, uh, Pan-Asian, uh, similar numbers come out the same way. So you say to yourself, okay, I, I need to know that monthly number. And I need to save at least six months. Now, I would say if you can save eight months, better. I always was a little concerned because there, there's an old saying, life happens. And mm -hmm. being less earthy than the true saying. All right. So life happens. And Murphy, Mr. Murphy, Murphy's Law has a way of throwing a wrench into your plans. So the best laid plans can and will be tested. So, but with that good foundation, and it, you need to also save 10 to 20% of your income. I would say to myself, if I could save 20% of my income, I would not have to worry about Mr. Murphy. I would not have to worry about the things that can throw you a wrench into your plans because mm -hmm. you have properly put yourself into a position and don't say that 10 times fast. <laughs> but, uh, you properly put yourself into a position that you're ready to excel because when you start investing at a very young age, your money grows like wildfire. You have compounding, you have time on your side. I mean, 30, 40 years making, you know, 8%, you could quintuple you know, your money in that period of time. And the next thing you know, you know, you, you have millions. I have personally witnessed this with clients. I have personally witnessed this with friends that they have made substantial gains in their net worth because of that simple maneuver. Now you ask if you want to share yours and let's talk about the people who are in their fifties. Okay. Mm -hmm. I am 51. I'm turning 52. Uh, in three two weeks and happy the, early birthday <laughs> thank you and the, the one thing i will tell you if i had to start all over again would be forget the 20 percent rule if you have that disposable income you put 40 percent away i don't care if you go to your hr and say put, take that 40 percent and put it into x bank account and then from that x bank account you take that money and shift it either into a, a Roth uh, IRA account or a Roth 401k account, all right? In better places, it's Roth 401k. And the reason being is that we're talking tax-free versus tax-deferred. Plus, there are no income limits with the Roth 401k. You just have to be with an employer that offers this. And I have found that's one strategy. But if they don't have the Roth, then you can easily find an investment vehicle, mutual funds and the like that will grow your money in a steady pace and still be able to have a substantial amount of money. Because you're in your 50s, you have to remember, you are entering into your highest earning years and your highest earning years go by very quick because you <laughs> want to get out of the game. Except me, uh, I, they're going to have to put me on the stretcher and take me out that way. <laughs> There's a love, you know, I just love doing this. And, uh, you know, so, but most people are like, oh God, it's, it's been 50 years, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm yes. 70 years old, I'm out of here, you know, I, I get it, you know, because the last thing you want to have, and I actually had someone that this happened to, they retired and this used to be the norm. This used to absolutely be the norm where you would retire at 65, right? And then two years to five years later, you were gone. You weren't on the earth anymore. You had your pension. Yeah, big deal. But w what good is it if nobody gets it? You know, that goes back to your company's pension. Mm -hmm. So that's why they made the shift. That was one of the catalysts for the shift from the pension to the 401k. I hmm. am not a big believer in that, Carrie. 
I believe that the pension plan has its benefits and the most flexible bench pension plans can benefit your family for the rest of their lives. But not every company, you know, we're only seeing municipalities and older companies offering that type of solution. I hope that it starts to come back. I hope that they find a more cost-effective solution because we really need it. We by ourselves are not saving enough for retirement. I believe that we need to be doing better, but we also need help. And I'm not yeah. talking about monetary help. I'm talking about education, that formation from when you're a young uh, student, you know, why isn't this a core <laughs> subject in public schools or private schools for that matter? You know, and the reason being is there is not enough people saying, hey, I want this. But in the school, and, but it's a tale of two cities. You know, there are people in well-to-do areas that have what's called enrichment programs. And those programs include financial education. They bring in a parent. I've done these type of talks, you know, and you you hope that the people, the parents are leaving with a better knowledge than when they first sat down. Yeah, I think you're right. Like I said, I I, I don't, I remember my high school had like one class on finances yeah. and the guy just spoke about one bank the whole time. It was very weird. I don't remember it being really helpful. Um, and so I did learn some from my parents, but I learned a lot from working with various accountants and financial advisors to really understand, you know, okay, this is where you should be. And it's very empowering once you get there. I think, you know, one of the other things that happens when people are struggling is they might say, okay, I hear you, but they can't get their mindset around, you know, being able to save or feel like they can save to be able to invest. Do you have any type of mindset tips or tricks, especially if, again, maybe they don't have a good mental or emotional feeling about money because of how they grew up. Yeah, uh, in the event that you cannot do this yourself, my first piece of advice is to put it on automatic. That simply means that when your paycheck comes to you electronically, that a portion of that paycheck, whatever percentage that is recommended to you or that you have decided upon, goes directly to your 401k, you know, whether it be Roth or regular, and a lot, you know, that the investments you choose in there, uh, and I would always uh, give advice for those investments for many years. I still do it to this day. You know, I'll tell the person, hey, you got a 401k? Okay, let me see the funds in there. Let me give you some advice towards that. And I would give them the exact percentages to do so. And people love that. You know, that's one part. But if you can automatically do that, do so right away and then get together with an advisor at least three to four times a year. I think that's where I've differentiated myself is that we have done our earnest best to get together with people three to four times a year, whether it be Zoom call, phone call, you know, in person and all that stuff. Education is a big part of it. There are some people that do not want to have any of this knowledge. They are too intimidated by it. Those are the people who need financial advisors. They are delegators. They are too busy with their business. They are executives too busy with their work. Can you imagine a show producer having the time to do their own, uh, you know, 401k decisions and the like? They don't have time for that. You know, I, I, I love producers. And the one thing that the one universal truth is that they're overworked and underpaid. So they don't have time. And all of a sudden, you know, my mom had this one saying, she's like, you know, you may not think you have the time, but then 10 years goes by. Yeah. That was one of the best things she ever told me. And it's true. It's true. 10 years yeah. goes in a blink. Yeah. So it's like you said, it's it's good to kind of start, start small. Um, it doesn't have to be scary. There are people to help. Now, on the other end, if you have people that have been investing, they're doing pretty well. There's a lot of changes going in this financial space. You know, a lot of people saying, OK, maybe I want to be investing in things like crypto or maybe I want to be getting out of a bank and going into more some of these fintech things. There's a lot of changes and people are kind of like, well, what's maybe the advice to do now? If I've been doing my normal retirement, some basic investments, do you have maybe a piece of advice for those people that are at that level? Yeah, fintech. 
uh, you know, digital currency, uh, all these things. It's sexy. It's exciting, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, okay, but what's it backed up by? You know, what's behind it? Do you understand it? And most people couldn't understand it to give me a half decent answer. And I say, I believe in what I can see. You know, I know that there's a company there. You know, the difference between my father's generation and my generation, my father's generation wanted to go kick the building at the bank. You know, they understood real estate. They understand insurance. My generation understands stocks, understands bonds, mutual funds. They kind of sort of understand crypto, you know, but not really. And my advice to them is you don't want to you want to make sure that, you know, it's kind of like Warren Buffett says, if you don't understand it, don't get in. All right. And some people say, well, there's a ton of money to be made there. I have made money there. But you have to ask yourself, what if it goes away tomorrow as it could? You just don't know. I'm not saying it's going. I'm actually a big believer in digital currency and the potential, the potentiality of that growth. But I would never do it with more than 10% of my money. You know, I, 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 there's, you know, you have to ask yourself what stage in life you're at. You know, I see people investing in Tesla. You know, millennials are investing in Tesla at a huge rate. And yeah, they've made some money, you know, but what happens is that you have, when you're looking at one company, there's about a hundred other companies that are doing something similar, if not better. You know, and I'm not talking about the type of product. I'm talking yeah. about the type of growth exponentially from the stock. And that's something you've got to really stay cognizant of. So if I'm a young investor, I want to find an advisor. You know, everybody's been misled. They've been taught from an early age that, advisors suck. And I'm going to speak plainly, you know, that advisors are no good. They're only after your money. I'll let you in on a little secret. We work anywhere between 14 to 16 hours a day in the beginning. And once we're past that, I mean, I, I'm still up. I'm, I'm up at the crack of dawn, you know, looking at portfolios, plotting and planning how to make my clients money. Some days we don't trade at all. Some days we do. But I think it's more importantly to ask yourself, if you have an advisor, do I get along with this person? Mm -hmm. And I ask myself the same question about the client. I go, do I get along with this person? You know, we're going to be together 20 years. I have clients who are together with me more than 20 years. And the one thing I say, do I like this person? You know, because we're going to be together a long time. We better get along. So when we, you're doing your due diligence, personality is a big thing. Do not discount it. Now, not everybody loves me, you know, but I have a core of clients who really like what I'm doing. They like the fact that I'm doing TV. They like the fact that I'm handling their affairs and they're very comfortable with me over the years. But I have earned that right. That's not something they gave up in a heartbeat. And some do, don't get me wrong. Like I said, the delegators tend to do that. But someone who is, as you said, well-versed, in the vernacular or the mm -hmm. language of investments will come and meet me, know that I'm for real, understand that isn't just about numbers. Because I say to uh, inevitably, we are going to have a bad quarter. You know, I've gone through, I, I want to say uh, three recessions. I've gone through international crisis. I've gone through digital crisis. Mm -hmm. I've gone through, you know, the COVID, <laughs> all, 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 the COVID now, you know, yeah. which uh, honestly, a lot of financial advisors escaped relatively unscathed. They actually built up their businesses even more because people were at home to actually listen to the advice. They weren't, mm -hmm. oh God, I got to get into a car. I got to get to the office. It's his office. He's going to tell me something. I might absorb maybe 10% of that. Now we hop on a Zoom call or a phone call and I can take my time with them and they can take their time with me and it's quality, quality, quality. And that is the source of great relationship. How high quality, not high level, high quality the conversation becomes. And with that, 
the understanding improves and the trust develops. And these are all important things to have between clients and their advisors. Because if you don't have it, you're missing a key component and you're not going to really do well. You're going to jump from advisors to advisors. And I have running jokes with some of my clients. I go, how many advisors you have before me? And they would tell me, yeah, I had like seven or eight. Or one, one particular client, you know very well, Achilles, I had eight advisors before you. And how many <laughs> did you have after? And they go, just you. <laughs> you know, and, and they appreciate profession. They appreciate someone who is fighting in their corner. Because that's what we do. We fight for them. We fight for every nickel and penny we go after. We suffer when they suffer. You know, there are advisors out there, you know, one particular house, I'm not going to name their name. They're like, well, you know, when they, if client benefits, we benefit. And when, you know, then I ask, okay, well, when the market goes down, what happens to you? You get a pay cut of, you know, in the financial crisis, there were a lot of mutual funds that went down 40, 50%. You took a pay cut of 40, 50%. How is that not a conflict of interest? That is a big problem in this industry that mm. people expect not to pay for our services when they should be paying the same rate no matter what. Some sort of flat fee with incentive uh, incentives or and the industry is slow to catch on to this. But you need to have that in order that the advisor doesn't get any crazy ideas with their clients. Because I hear about clients you know, lost money because the advisor absconds with money or, you know what, guy takes a 40% pay cut, all of a sudden these stupid thoughts enter their heads, you know, and broker dealers have all these controls in places, but if someone is determined to steal, they're going to steal, you know, and I'm not saying that that's, you know, when the financial crisis hit, I said, you know, I took a step further. I said, you're going to get charged the same. It goes up, I'm not going to make more money. It goes down, I'm not going to make less money. So mm -hmm. we are on an even playing field, right? And this, I think, makes L'Oreal pretty unique. The second part of it is that with the cost of living goes up every year. So my expenses go up. Guess what? I'm going to have to pass that on to you. But it's going to be reasonable. You know, we're talking the cost of labor. What are we talking about? 2%? You know, it's not a big deal in the big scheme of things, but it keeps us on an even playing level. And it also puts us on the true same side of the tape, not just, oh, we're going to go up a little bit and I'm going to make a little more. I get the benefit too. Let's do a dance, you know? No, that's ridiculous. You know, I just, I'm an advisor who tells it like it is. I think that most advisors skirt around the fee issue. I tell you what it's going to cost you. You know, and guess what? In some cases, if you have, you know, millions of dollars, this is going to cost you thousands. But if you don't have millions, we're still going to talk and you're going to walk away with good information. And you're going to walk away with not somebody who just wants to say what you want to hear, but that you're fully informed and you walk away better than you did when you walked into their office or got hopped on to that Zoom call. And I think yeah. that's how every advisor should be. But unfortunately, it is not the truth right now. Well, it goes back to what you were saying. It's it's you want someone who's knowledgeable, who's educated, who's been through it, but also that you are just on the same page personality wise. And like you said, it's everybody kind of has their own brand and kind of finding the right person that fits for you and your needs and gets it. So I think that's an important piece too. And, and making sure you have that, that right connection. If people yeah, I do might get some hate, uh, <laughs> I might get some hate calls or emails or texts from fellow advisors and guys are, who are wonderful, but you know what? I, I speak truth and uh, you know, that, that, that's always been part of my MO. You know, when I wrote my book to the Latino community, I said it plainly. You know, I said most of them don't, you know, don't know anything about investing. And, you know, uh, it struck a chord. It struck a nerve. And some people didn't like it. Uh, but they knew that the book had knowledge that they never saw before. You know, and yeah. we finally translated it into Spanish. And that's going to be coming out in the next year or so. 
Great. Well, that's very exciting. If people want to learn more, if they want to get educated, so maybe they want to get the book or read your blog, or they want to connect with you, where is the best place to do that? Well, let's start at the website. The first thing is LaRealWealth.com. That's L-A-R-R-E-A Wealth.com. There you get to see me. In my I was probably in that first video there. I was probably about 60 pounds heavier. Uh, I, I became plant-based. So I lost about 110 pounds uh, from that. Which point. is amazing. Uh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and you know, that's the first place. Second place, I would encourage your viewers, make a phone call. This is the good old days. You want to make a <laughs> phone call? I'm here. The wonderful thing about my phone number, it's also a text. You can text it as well. <laughs> hey, Achilles. I butchered your name spelling, but man, I want to talk to you, you know, and that number is 212-390-8918. And we're going to have an honest conversation. And it's okay if you don't know everything. I'm not here to beat up on you. There's no judgment here. I just want to help. And I can only do that if I know what's going on. By the way, most people need to get a little bit more serious about this and tell the truth to advisors. We assume that people, when they come to us, lie about 40% of the time mm. because they're afraid to tell us, you know, yeah. what's really going on. And it usually takes a few meetings to, to get to that point. I say, I encourage you, tell, tell me up front. You're not going to make me cry. You might make me a little <laughs> sad. But you're not going to well, make it goes back, like you said, yeah, to that that honesty and and that trust, which does take time to build. So that makes sense. Absolutely. But the last question I like to ask all of my guests, Achilles, is what is one word or quote or mantra that you try to live by every single day? Tell the truth. Your clients may not, you know, you may want and may not. As a client, you may not want to hear it, but you're gonna always know a couple of things, that I'm working hardest that I am for you, and I'm always trying my best. Knowing that I really like you, if not, you would not have become a client of mine. And I really care about you and your family. It takes a lot of guts to get to the point where you got when you came to me. And it's taking years for us to become friends. I'm happy I'm your friend. I'm happy you consider me for things in your life and share things that you may not share with your best friends or family members. I am proud to be your advisor every single day. And I never forget where I came from. I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I worked for everything that I had. And I want to make sure that I'm working that hard for you all the time. Well, I think that is a great mantra to have not only professionally, but personally. So I thank you so much for sharing your personal story, as well as some tips for people to get started or to just continue on their financial journey. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me, Carrie. An honor, a privilege, and a pleasure. And hopefully we can do this when my new book comes out.